Welcome to episode 37 of Math 1050 College Algebra. I'm Dennis Allison. Uh, today we're going to be talking about counting principles. Let's go to our list of objectives. Uh, basically, there are three types of problems that we'll be considering today. And uh, they're, they're all basically related to the very first item, and that is the fundamental counting principle. Uh, here's an example of a question that we could answer with the fundamental counting principle. And that is, uh, in how many ways can you answer a true-false test uh, if you know the number of questions. For example, if there were 10 questions on the test, how many ways could you answer it? Then we'll look at permutations, which is related to the fundamental counting principle. And uh, a question that pertains to that might be, in how many ways can the San Francisco Giants arrange their batting order by position? Uh, so we'll talk about that in a moment. And then finally, we'll look at combinations. And the question there is, um, how many five-card poker hands are possible using an ordinary deck of cards? Okay, well, let's go to the next graphic, and we'll look at uh, sort of an introduction to the fundamental counting principle. Uh, here's, my, here's sort of an outline of my studio dressing room wardrobe. Uh, I have a number of uh, stylish frocks. I have a lumberjack uh, plaid shirt. Uh, I have my paisley print. I have my uh, blue on white polka dot shirt. Uh, and then, of course, I have this shirt that I'm wearing today that they've provided me. Uh, then I also have a choice of uh, celebrity trousers. Um, I could have wear my uh, checkered dungarees uh, or my uh, Greco-Roman loincloth. You remember the day I wore that back? I, f I forget the episode. Um, or I, I could wear my uh, black cap and gown. Uh, or I could wear the, uh, the uh, Clan Allison kilt. Yeah, I really like that one. Uh, or, I, of course, I could wear the trousers that I'm wearing today. So the question is, with this assortment of uh, dressing uh, wear, uh, how many, shall we say, ensembles could I put together uh, choosing a frock and a pair of trousers? We'll, we'll call the uh, black uh, cap and gown a pair of trousers, although that would be a little much, wouldn't it? But for the sake of argument, we'll include that. Okay, well, uh, if we go back and look at that graphic one more time, I need to point out something. How many frocks uh, do I have a choice of there? It uh, looks like there are four, yeah. The lumberjack plaid, the paisley print, the polka dot, or of course this solid blue shirt. Uh, and how many pairs of trousers, sort of an extended idea of trousers are there? Five. Looks like there are five, yeah, okay. So I'm wondering how many ways can I put those together uh, in one form or another? Well now let's come to the green board and we'll look at that. So we have uh, four, let's see, let me get a different marker. We have uh, four choices for frocks, and we had five choices for trousers. Now, does anybody want to guess in how many ways you could combine one frock and one pair of trousers? 20 ways. Okay, Jeff, now, uh, it looks like you probably multiplied rather than added, for example. And as a matter of fact, that's what the fundamental counting principle is all about. If you can do the first thing in four ways, and if I can choose a, choose a frock in four ways, and if I can choose a pair of trousers in five ways, uh, then I can do one and then the other in that order 20 ways, four ways times five ways. Now, for example, when I go to my uh, wardrobe closet and I choose a frock, well, there's one, two, three. There are actually four choices that I have there. And then with each one of those pair of, uh, with, with each one of those frocks, I have five pair of trousers. So I'll put five branches coming off of this one. And then there's not enough room to show it, but imagine that I put in five here, five here, and five here. So that'd be five and five and five and five, 20. So the, the, the quick way to come up with an ensemble where you choose uh, this frock and maybe this pair of trousers, the number of ways you come up with a pairing would be four times five. And that, in a nutshell, is the fundamental counting principle. So let's go to the next graphic and we'll see this spelled out in words. Okay, so the fundamental counting principle says that if two events occur in sequence and the first can occur in m ways and the second in n ways, then the two events can occur in succession in m times n ways. Okay, now with that principle behind us, uh, let's look at an example of this. Let's go to the next graphic. In how many ways can you answer a 10 question true-false exam if each question is answered. Okay, well, let's see. Um, 
let's see, ten, a 10 question test. So imagine that I put down 10 spaces here. that represent our 10 answers. Now, in each space, I can put either true or, or, or false. Let's see, let me move that down a little bit for you. I can either put uh, true or false uh, for, for each answer. And I see that's not showing up, so let me try uh, one with another marker here, true or false. Okay, so if, if these are my options for each of these uh, answers, then I have two ways I can answer the first question. But you know, I have two ways I can answer the second question, and two ways I can answer the third question, et cetera, until I get to the very end. Now, if I multiply these together according to the fundamental uh, counting principle, instead of just m times n, it'll be two times two times two, et cetera, this is gonna give me a product of uh, two to the 10th power. And two to the 10th power is a little over 1,000. It's uh, 1,024. So if you were guessing on a, uh, on a uh, true-false exam, there are actually 1,024 ways you can answer it. There's only one way you could, you could guess all the answers correct. So uh, we'll talk about probability in the next episode, but the probability of guessing and getting all the questions correct would be 1 in 1,024. We'll talk about probability some more uh, next, in the next episode. Okay, um, I tell you what, now what if we change the question, this same question, and say, what if uh, you don't answer every question? What if you leave some blank? Of course, somebody might say, well, that'd be kind of foolish because at least you could, you could guess and try to get the answer right. But if we include the option of leaving the answer blank, uh, then there would be three possibilities on each question. And so this a the answer now for the number of possible ways we could, take we could answer the questions would be three to the 10th power, which is considerably more uh, than 1,000. Okay, uh, let's go to the next problem. Let's go to the next problem. Okay, in this problem, we have a hamburger chain that offers burgers uh, that are so incredible that in addition to the patty, you have all of these choices. Uh, you can take lettuce, you could take uh, tomato, you could have uh, pickles, either sweet or dill. Uh, you could have bacon, onion. Uh, they offer three types of buns. Uh, there's the toasted, the sourdough, or, or the plain. Uh, there are uh, three choices for dressings. And the question is, how many variations are possible? Now, we're gonna assume that you are choosing the hamburger patty, otherwise I guess we couldn't call it a hamburger. But you do have choices in everything else. You could either take the lettuce or leave it. You could take the bacon addition or leave it off, et cetera. So we want to figure out how many variations of a hamburger there are. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, for lettuce, how many choices do we have for lettuce? I'm thinking either you could take lettuce or not. That'd be two choices. So I'll, I'll put down a two. Uh, now going down this column for tomato, you can either take tomato or not. So uh, I'll multiply, whoops, by two again. Uh, for pickles, how many choices do we have for pickles? Three. Three choices, either sweet or dill or? None. Or none. Or right. both. Someone might, yes, exactly. Someone might say both, but I don't think, that, I don't think uh, anyone would take sweet and dill at the same time. So let's don't consider that as a reasonable option, although theoretically it's possible. So we'll say there are three options for pickles, uh, either sweet or dill or no pickles at all. Uh, now there, for bacon, let's see, we should multiply by two. Uh, three types of buns, uh, toasted, sourdough, or plain. And uh, let's say you do want a bun, otherwise I don't think we could call it a hamburger. It would just be a, a, a pile of assorted ingredients. Uh, so we'll say multiply by three in that case. Uh, choice of three dressings. So what number shall I multiply there? Uh, three. Four. Three, four, okay. yeah, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what are you thinking is the fourth option? No dressing. No dressing at all. Some people may not want dressing on their burger. Um, and then you could either take onions or not onions, so that would be two. So I guess this comes down to multiplying two times two times three times two times three times four times two. Now you know if we simplify this a little bit, this is two to the fourth times three squared times four. 
Now, you know, 4 is actually 2 squared, so why don't we just put two more 2's in here and call that 2 to the 6th. 2 to the 6th times 3 squared. Uh, does anybody know what uh, 2 to the 6th is right offhand? What, what's, two to the f what's 2 to the 3rd? 8. 8, right. So what's 2 to the 6th? 64. 64, right. It'd just be 8 squared, right. This is 2 to the 3rd times 2 to the 3rd. So we have 64 times 9. And 64 times 9, let's see, that's going to be 36, 576. So we have 576 options on uh, how we could choose a hamburger. You know, you could go to this hamburger place every day for lunch, seven days a week, for about a year and a half before you'd have to choose the same selection twice. That's why the burgers are just so incredible at this hamburger joint. Okay, um, let's go to the next problem. How many license plates are possible in Utah if the plate, uh, if the plate has three numbers followed by three letters? You know, on, on passenger cars in Utah, uh, currently you have three digits followed by three letters. Um, so how many plates are possible if you do that? Well, let's see, what, what principle do you think we'll use to solve this problem? What, what principle are we discussing here? Fundamental counting. A fu fundamental counting principle, of course. So I'm thinking that I should write down a series of numbers, and if the license plate contains uh, three numbers followed by three letters, I guess I need a total of six blanks. And um, so how many choices do we have in the first? Ten. Ten choices for the ten digits, and then ten choices here and then 10 choices here. So uh, that's going to be a thousand choices to fill in the first uh, three digits. What would be the smallest three-digit number you could put in here? Zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero. And what's the biggest you could have? Nine, 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 nine. Nine, ninety-nine. And how many number, how many integers are there including zero, zero, zero up to nine, ninety-nine? A thousand. That'd be a thousand, right. And that's 10 times 10 times 10. Okay, now we go to the alphabet and it looks like we have uh, 26 choices here. 26 choices here and 26 choices here. Now, you know, actually, uh, on license plates, they might restrict some letters from being used in a license plate. Can you think of a reason why? There are some letters. Yeah, like, uh, I, I'm not sure they'd actually use all 26 letters in a license plate. Why is that? If some are reserved, like, I guess, um, for um, special cases? Uh, well, that, that could be. That, I, I'm not aware of that, but that would seem reasonable. I know government uses certain combinations uh, of letters. Like Q, Q why? and O look a lot alike, so it might be. Q and O look a lot alike, and Q and O look a lot like what else? They look yeah. like Zeros. a zero, don't they? So uh, I think O might be eliminated, uh, whereas Q might be. It seems like I've seen Q on license plates. Also, I'm thinking that I may not be used because I may look like a one. But we're assuming that they're, they're going to use every possible letter, so I'm going to use 26 times 26 times 26, and we'll leave it up to the state licensing bureau to decide whether they want to eliminate a letter or not. So to find out how many license plates are possible, uh, our answer is going to be 10 to the third times 26 to the third, which is, well, let's just see on our calculator how much that is. Uh, so if we can zoom in here. Um, well, we know that 10 to the third is 1,000, so I'll just go ahead and enter that, times 26 raised to the power of 3. And that gives us um, 17,576,000. You notice there are three zeros on the end here, which makes sense because we multiplied by 1,000, which has three zeros on the end. So we, we know it's going to be some multiple of 1,000. So it's 17,576,000. Let's see, 17,576,000 license plates. Now, you know, there aren't nearly that many people in the state of Utah, but do you think there are that many cars in Utah? Well, it's hard to say, but if you think about families that have several cars, if you think about all the businesses that have uh, uh, maybe a fleet of cars, uh, then uh, it's uh, probably not likely they're going to have this many, this many uh, vehicles that we need all those license plates. But uh, before the state gets even close to using up all those license plate numbers, they'll resort to a different system 
for numbering the license plates. For example, in many states, what they do is they reverse the letters and the numbers. They put the letters first and then the numbers second, and then you have this many license plates all over again. Uh, let me just ask you a couple questions about this while I have these numbers here on the screen. Let's look at some possibilities for changing license plates in the event that these were about to be used up. Which do you think would provide more new license plates? If I changed a, a digit into, uh, excuse me, a digit into a letter, or a letter into a digit? A digit into a letter. Okay, and why do you think that would create more license plates? Let's see, just to make sure everybody understands the question before Stephen answers that, suppose your license number were uh, 754ABC. And so the question is, if we change this digit into a letter, uh, would we get more license plates than if we changed this letter into a digit? Which one would make more license plates? Uh, Stephen, what, what is your choice? I said um, change the digit into a letter. Yeah, okay, would change this into a letter, okay, and what, what is your reasoning for that? Because um, we'd be changing one of those one of those numbers up there into uh, okay. 26, so yeah. it would be 10 squared now times 26 to the power of 4 would be the total number. That right, you could so what we're doing have. is we're, we're trading off a smaller factor for a bigger factor, so you're going to get a bigger answer. So you're going to get even more than 17 million and 500,000, 500, whatever it was, something like that. Okay, uh, of course, now if you were to change a letter into a digit, then you'd be changing a 26 into a 10, and you'd actually be decreasing the number of license plates that were possible in that case. Now, you know what a lot of states have done is they've, they've changed individual digits in the letter. So you may have a digit, or rather a letter, followed by two digits and then three letters. Or you may put a letter in the middle, have a digit on either side. Or you may have a letter at, in the third position. So in other words, there's a number of ways you can, you can make variations of these license plates. Um, now, another question, what do you think would have a greater effect if we were to do as Stephen just suggested and change uh, the digit into a letter or as an option, what if we added an extra digit? So this one being, being the new position. So I now have uh, the 10, the 10, the 10, 26, 26, 26, but I'm going to add an extra digit in front. So now I have a four-digit number followed by uh, three letters. Which do you think here would make more possible license plates? The top one. Uh, let's see. Okay, now in the top case, we said mm -hmm. that would be, well, it was 10 cubed times 26 cubed. Now it's going to be uh, 10 squared times 26 to the fourth, which is how much? Let's see. Let's go to the calculator and work that one out. Um, now we have 10 squared times 26 to the fourth. 10 squared is, uh, whoops, let's see. Let me clear that. 10 squared is 100. I'll go ahead and write that one down. Times 26 raised to the fourth power, which is going to be... Um, 45,697,600. Uh, let's say that's going to be around 45,700,000. Okay, so 45,700,000. Now, while I have the calculator up here, let's go ahead and do the other case. What numbers would I enter if I actually added an extra digit in front? Uh, 10 to the 4th times 26 to the third? Ten to, 10 to the fourth times 26 to the third. Okay, now 10 to the fourth is going to be 10,000. Let's just verify that. Um, 10 raised to the fourth power. And then I'm going to multiply that times 26 to the third. And uh, you see now I have four zeros on the end of the number because I'm multiplying by 10 to the fourth or 10,000. And this is going to be uh, 175,760,000. Well, there's no comparison. It looks like if you add the extra digit, you get 10 times as many um, license plates. But if you change the 10 to a 26, you're going to do a little bit more than double it. You're not going to quite triple it because you've replaced 10 with a number that's not even the triple of 10. So uh, we're going to get many more license plates by adding an extra digit in that case. Okay. 
Um, let's go to the next. Uh, let's go to the next graphic. Okay, here's a problem that's uh, more visual, I think. And uh, it says on that on this first cube with the A and the B's located on it. Suppose you want to travel from A to B along the edges of the cube, uh, shown to the right. What is the length of the What is the length of the shortest path? Well, let's see. Uh, if if that's a when I say a unit cube, what I mean is that every every edge there is one unit long, like maybe one foot long. So if I go from A to B, then I could travel, say, this way, this way, and then this way. How how long would that path be? Three units. It'd be three units. Now another possibility is I could go this way, and then I could go straight up, and then I could go across the top, and that's going to be uh, a length of three also. And in fact, I think if if you even go back behind the cube, you can go uh, say back this way, then you can go up, and then you can go over. That would still be three. So I think every path along here is going to be uh, three um, three units long. Now let me ask you a question. In how many ways can I travel from A to B? Well, you know. What this involves is making some sort of decision every time I travel along a unit length. In the beginning, how many options do I have? Two. Three. Uh, three. Three, actually. Yeah, th this, would be, this would include the, the path going back behind that we, uh, that we uh, let me just kind of draw that in here that we haven't shown in the illustration. So, you know, we could go to the right, we could go up, or we could go back behind. Now, once I get to the next point, either here, or here, or back there. Uh, no matter which place I get to, how many choices do I have for my next move? Two. I have only two. Yeah, because we're moving toward B. So, for example, if you're at this corner, you can go back or you can go up. If you're up at this corner, you can go to the right or you can go back. And if you're at this hidden corner back here, you can go to the right or you can go up. So, when I get to the second <coughs> stage, I have two choices. Now, when I get to the third stage, for ex uh, when I, well, let's see, uh, actually this would be the end of the second stage, uh, it looks like I have only one choice. I'm going to go directly to B. Or if I get to here, I go directly to B. Or if I go to here, I go directly to B. So, um, to sum that up, it looks like at, at, in the first position, I have three choices. In the second position, I have two choices. And in the third position, I have only one choice. And if I multiply those together, I get uh, six. By the way, we have, a, we have a symbol for this. What do we call three times two times one? Three factorial. Three factorial, yeah. So uh, we have three factorial ways that we can go from A to B. And that ends up being a total of six choices. OK, now, here's the real problem. And that is, go to the second illustration over here, going from A to C. And the question is to find the number of options for the shortest path from A to C in the second illustration. So in how many ways can I go from A to C if I assume I'm following the shortest path? Now what I mean by that is you don't go over and up and then back down again and then back and then up. In other words, you would just be retracing your step. So you always want to be making progress to get towards C. Anyone have an idea how you could solve this problem? The number of ways you can get from A to C. Stephen. Well, in the first cube, we're going to want to get to the the place that was point B. So there's going to yeah. be six ways to get to there. Yeah, let me just write a B in right there. You see, these two cubes uh, touch right there at that vertex. So as you leave one cube, you go on to the next cube. Um, so you had six ways to go from A to B. And then there'll be six ways again to get from B to C. So from B to be C. Six times six. Six ways. times six, yeah. So because we know there are six ways you can go from A to the four corner B and then do the same thing from B going to C, if I can do the first thing six ways and I can do the second thing six ways, there are six times six are 36. Six times six are 36 ways that I can travel from A to C along these shortest paths. By the way, how long would the shortest path be if, the, if these are both unit cubes? Six. Uh, yes, because you'd travel a distance of three on the first cube and then a distance of three on the second cube. Okay, well now let's introduce permutations and let's do this by going to the next graphic. 
Now, if I take a permutation of objects, what I mean is I'm going to count the number of ways that I can, I can rearrange the objects in some order. So in this graphic, it says that a permutation uh, on a set of members of a set uh, of distinct objects is an ordering of those objects. And I want to count the number of permutations of those n objects. Now, what if I were taking them r at a time? That is, I'm not using all of them, but I'm using some subset of them. The, the number of permutations on n objects taken r at a time, which is abbreviated as p of n r, can be calculated using this formula right here. Now, let me explain the formula, where it comes from, and we'll also illustrate what we mean by a permutation. Let's go to the green board. Okay, suppose I have, um, suppose I have five objects, let's say five books. Um, so uh, let's say here's a book, this is my math book, I'll put an M on top of it. And then I have a history book, so I'll put an H on top of that. And then let's say we have, a, uh, uh, we have a psychology book. I'll put a P on top of it for psychology. And then I have uh, one more book. That might be my English book, let's say. I'll put an E on top of that. So this is my set of objects, and I want to count the number of ways that I can arrange them. Well, if I'm going to arrange them, I would consider four blanks. And I have four ways that I can fill in the first blank with one of those books. And then I have three ways left that I can fill in the, the next blank, because I've already used up one of the books here. And then I have two ways I can fill in the next slot. And then once I filled in those three, there's only one book left. There's only one way I can fill in the last slot. And this gives me four factorial, or 24 ways that I can arrange those four books in order. Now, suppose I didn't want to use all the books. Suppose I was only going to pick three of the books. In how many ways could I, pick, could I arrange three books? Well, let's see. There would be only three blanks to fill in. One of these books is not going to be used. How many ways could I choose one of those books to fill in the first, the first space? Four. Four ways. Mm -hmm. And in how many ways could I fill in the second space? Three. Three. And then two. Now, there's one book left over that I haven't used here. And this gives me 24 once again. So there are still 24 ways that I can arrange three books out of four. Now, the way I would describe this is I would say this is the number of permutations on four objects taken three at a time, because I'm only using three books at a time. OK, one more, one more question. What if I was only going to take two of those books? In how many ways could I arrange two of those four books in order? Well, there are four ways that I could fill in the first space, and there are three ways I could fill in the second space. The other two books are not going to be used. And this gives me 12 ways that I could arrange two books out of, out of four. So I would call this the number of permutations on four objects taken two at a time. So here's what we have calculated symbolically. If I count the number of permutations on four objects taken four at a time, we saw that that was four factorial or 24. If I count the number of ways of uh, taking, counting the permutations on four objects taken three at a time, we saw that was four times three times two, and that's also 24. And if I count the number of permutations on four objects taken two at a time, that was only four times three, and that's equal to 12 in that case. So you see how this notation goes. Four represents the number of objects I have to choose from, and r, uh, or the two in this case, represents the number uh, of objects that are actually being counted. Now, you know, in some textbooks, they abbreviate this first one as p sub 4, 4, where this is the number of objects you have to choose from. This is the number of objects you actually use. And uh, some books then would also write this one as p sub 4, 3. Uh, four objects taken three at a time. And of course, this last one would be p sub 4, 2. Now, you know, one, one case we didn't consider is what would be p sub 4, 1, or p of the ordered pair 4, 1. In how many ways can you arrange four objects when they're taken one at a time? Four. four. That'd be four, yeah, because there'd only be one blank to fill in. That would be four in that case. Uh, now, you know, there's a, there's a formula that will, that will compute this, and the formula goes as follows. And this is the formula that you just saw in that graphic a moment ago. And it says that, the, that if you want to calculate 
P of N R, and of course this is assuming that uh, uh, N is greater than or equal to R, and R is greater than or equal to zero, then the formula says what you do is you take N factorial and you divide it by the difference factorial, N minus R factorial. Now you might say, where, where in the world does that come from? Well, let's just take a look at where, how this comes about. Suppose that I had n books, not four, but n books, and suppose I wanted to choose r of them to arrange. In how many ways could I arrange n objects when they're taken r at a time? Well, in this case, I would have to write down r blanks, because those are the r spaces that I'll need to fill in. So I have r spaces. And I have n books to choose from. So that means I could fill in the first slot with one of n books. How many books would be left over for the second slot? n minus 1. n minus 1, yep. How many books would be left over for this slot? n minus 2. n minus 2, yeah. Now, you notice the number that you're subtracting off is not quite the position number. I didn't subtract off three, I subtracted off two. So I'm subtracting off one less than the position number, and that's because in the very first position I subtracted off zero. So I started subtracting zero, then I subtracted one, then I subtracted two. And the next one, of course, would be n minus three. Now when I get down here to the rth space, if that makes sense, the space number r, then I'll be subtracting not r, I'll be subtracting r minus one or if I distribute that negative sign, that'll be n minus r plus 1. So if I want to calculate in how many ways I can fill in r spaces from n objects, I'll need to multiply those together. So I guess what this tells me is that p of n r should be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and that just keeps on going until I get to this last space, n minus the quantity r minus 1, or if you prefer, n minus r plus 1. So I'll need to multiply those together. Now, you know, that looks like a very messy calculation. I have to multiply those all out. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and fill in all of the remaining numbers so that this goes all the way down to 1. I'm going to take n, n minus 1, n minus 2, and then when I get to this number, n minus r minus 1, and then the next number that I'll subtract off, you notice these are going up, minus 1, minus 2, so the next number that I would put here would be n minus r, that would be the next number that goes up after r minus 1, and I'll keep going until finally I come to a 1, because these differences are decreasing, and so eventually I'll get to a 1. Now, I'll have to divide by any new factors that I've just included. Well, the factors that I have here are the same as the factors that I started with, but these are the new factors. That's n minus r all the way down to 1. Well, you know, this is n minus r factorial, what's on the bottom. And what is this on top? n factorial. That's n factorial. And look, that's our formula right there, n factorial over n minus r factorial. So what I've done is I've included extra factors so that I get a factorial on top, but that meant I had to divide by those same extra factors, and this is n minus r factorial on the bottom. Hence, we have our formula. Okay, now let's just try our formula in verifying that uh, problem about four books taken four or three or two at a time. So let's just verify our formula for those same numbers that we just looked at. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we had uh, p of 4, 4. Now you remember that was um, where we had four books and we were choosing them four at a time. So this would be 4 factorial over the difference factorial. That would be 4 minus 4 factorial. Or 4 factorial over 0 factorial. Or 4 factorial over, um, let's see, what is 0 factorial? One. Yeah, remember, just, just by definition, we say 0 factorial is 1, and so this gives me 4 factorial are 24 ways of arranging 4 books taken 4 at a time. If I take P of 4, 3, this would be 4 factorial over the difference factorial, and that's 4 factorial over 1 again, 
or 4 factorial, which is 24. And you remember that was the answer for uh, four books chosen three at a time. Now, how many permutations are there on four, four books taken two at a time? Well, that'll be 4 factorial divided by the difference factorial, 2 factorial. And now, rather than multiplying these numbers out individually, I would say let's write 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 2 times 1. In other words, we can see that the part of this cancels. And there's my 4 times 3, or 12, just like we saw before. If you prefer to multiply out 4 factorial and 2 factorial, you can do 2 factorials too. You can certainly do that, and you'll get the very same answer. Okay, let's go to the next graphic and look at another example. In how many ways can five books be arranged on a shelf? Well, in terms of permutations, this would be P of 5, 5. Or, you know, the other way to write it is to call it uh, P sub 5, 5. That's the number of permutations on five objects taken five at a time. And this would be 5 factorial divided by the difference factorial, 0 factorial, which is 5 factorial. And, you know, we just found out that 4 factorial was 24. And this just has an extra factor in it of 5. This would be 5 times 24. And that's 120. So there are 120 ways of arranging 5 books. OK, let's go to a, a different problem. OK, so in this next problem, we'll see, uh, we'll see a problem that can be done two different ways. In how many ways can a class of 30 students elect a president, a vice president, secretary, and treasurer, assuming that no one student can hold two offices? Well, now, one way to work this problem would be to use the fundamental counting principle and to think of there being four spaces where we make a choice for president, for vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And there are 30 ways that we can elect a president. And then once that office is filled, there are 29 choices for vice president, 28 choices for uh, secretary, and then 27 choices for treasurer. So if I multiply these numbers together, we will get, well, let's see here. We will get, if we zoom in, uh, 30 times 29 times 28 times 27. So there are going to be uh, 657,720. That's almost two-thirds of a million. Let's write that down here. 657,720. Now, the other way that we could work this problem would be to do, do it in terms of a permutation. So that would be P of 34. And that would be 30 factorial divided by the difference factorial, 26 factorial. Now, we obviously wouldn't want to write out all of these factors on top and bottom and cancel. But I think you can see that if you cancel 26 factorial out of 30, what will be left on top will be the 30, the 29, the 28, and the 27, where 26 on down have canceled off. And you see that's exactly what I've written up above and multiplied together. So it seems reasonable, then, that this ratio is going to be the same as that product right here. Now, we've already computed that answer, but let me show you how to, how to find this on a calculator. Uh, if I go to my uh, TI-82, uh, the way I'll calculate this is to enter 30. And then I'll go to the Math button. And let me just raise this up so you can see it. There's a button here that says Math. If I push that and I scroll over to the right, under PRB, that stands for probability, you notice there's uh, on item number two it says NPR. That's the number of permutations on N objects taken R at a time. Now I'm going to insert that right now after the 30. So if I insert that, I have 30, that's my value for N, and now I'll enter 4 for my value for R. Because you remember there were 30 things taken 4 at a time, and if I push enter, I get 657, 720, exactly. Let's just go back to that screen one more time, and you'll notice that under math, and if I scroll over to PR, I also have a factorial uh, item here that I can choose. So if you, want to if you want to compute a factorial, if you go under the math button, under the menu PRB, you can find your factorial that you could enter at that point. You know, on a lot of calculators, on simpler calculators than a graphing calculator, they'll have NPR and the factorial uh, on the keyboard, and you can actually access it directly on the keyboard. So you might look for that on your calculator if you have, uh, if you have that available to you. Okay, so this answer turned out to be 657, 720 uh, by this alternate approach. 
Okay, we have another permutation problem on the next graphic. In this case, it says six friends sit together in one row at a movie. In how many ways can they sit together? Well, in terms of permutations, that would be P of six people taken six at a time. In how many ways can they be arranged? So when I multiply that out, that would be, let's say, let's go to the green screen. That would be P of six, six, which is six factorial over zero factorial, or simply, six factorial. You see, we have six ways the first person can be placed in a seat, then we have five ways for the second person, and then four, and then three, and then two, and then one. So whether you think of it that way or using the formula, we get six factorial. And if I'm not mistaken, that turns out to be 720 ways for six people to sit in the theater um, next to one another. Now let's go back to that uh, graphic and we'll look at another question that's asked. Uh, the next question says, in how many ways can they sit together if two of them insist on sitting side by side? You know, you've been to the theater with that couple before. Yeah, they have to sit side by side. So anyone have a suggestion on how we could work that? See, we have six people at the theater. They're going to sit in a row, but two of them want to sit next to each other. You could treat them as if they're one object and then... The four others are enough, oh, uh, different objects, yeah. so there's five people sitting in five. Yeah, you know, I bet it's going to be something about five factorial, because if they have to sit together, we just kind of think of them as one group, uh, as, as one person. And so we kind of think of this as being uh, five people sitting in a row, when really there, there are two next to each other. Okay, now, on the green screen, this would say, take P of five, five. However, there's one other uh, issue we have to take care of. In which order do those two sit? Like, uh, if the two people are John and Mary, does John sit on the right of Mary, or does Mary sit on the right of John? We double it. We have to double it, exactly. So we're going to have to double this two times uh, P of 5, 5. And this gives me two times 5 factorial over 0 factorial, which is two times, let's see, 5 factorial is 120, and that's 240. Okay, so out of the 720 ways of seating these people, 240 of them have John and Mary sitting next to each other. Okay, but you know what happens? John and Mary have a falling out. Now let's go back to that last graphic. Now, in the last part, it says, what if two people refuse to sit side by side? So let's say John and Mary don't want any part of each other now. How many ways can they seat, can they be seated so that they're not sitting next to each other? Okay, well, if you come back to the green screen. Okay, now let's go back to that graphic one more time and look at the last question. <laughs> uh, what if two people refuse to sit side by side? Now, you see, what if John and Mary have had a falling out, and now rather than wanting to sit side by side, they refuse to sit side by side? In how many ways could that happen? Well, if you go to the green screen, it says that altogether there were 720 ways that we could seat the six people. In 240 ways, they're sitting side by side. So now let me ask the class, in how many ways are they not sitting side by side? 480. 480, yeah, it'd just be whatever's left over when I subtract those. So if we take 720 and subtract off uh, 240, we have 480 ways in which the six people can be seated and these two particular people are not sitting side by side. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go now to um, the next problem on the next graphic. Okay, in this problem, it says you are given five balls, each of a different color, and then we have two questions. The first one is one that we've actually worked before, I think, or something very much like it, but the second one is a, is a derivative of that. Uh, the first question says, in how many ways can these five balls be arranged? Now, if they're all of a different color, then we can distinguish each ball separately. And so uh, there would be five objects taken five at a time, and this would be P of 5, 5, which is 5 factorial over 0 factorial, or 5, factor 5 factorial. And that's 120 ways of arranging the balls. Okay, but now, do you think there would be more or fewer possibilities if we change the condition to there being three red and two yellow? Do you think we'll have more possibilities than 120 or fewer? Fewer. 
There'll be fewer, yeah, because now if three are red, if I switch two red balls, it, we wouldn't know the difference. So it would, be, it would be counted as the same arrangement. For example, if you had red, 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 yellow, yellow, and you switch two of the reds, it's still red, 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 yellow, yellow. So we'd have to count that one twice. So what I need to do is to find out within this 120, how many of them would I duplicate if I make three of them red, and then how many of these would I duplicate if I have two of them yellow? So I think what I'll need to do at this time is to take the total number of permutations, p of 5, 5, and I'll need to divide out all of the ways in which the three balls can be rearranged, because any rearrangement of the three red balls is going to count as the same arrangement. And uh, let's see, the number of permutations on three red balls, taken three at a time, is p of 3, 3. Now what this is doing is counting out the number of ways the three red balls can be rearranged in their, in their positions, and I want to count that only one time. And in the same way, there are two yellows. Now I could switch the two yellows, and I wouldn't recognize any difference in one of the arrangements. So I'm going to divide out p of 2, 2. And this gives me 5 factorial over 3 factorial times 2 factorial. And this gives me, let's see now, if I cancel one of these out, I'm going to cancel the larger factorial, the 3 factorial. That gives me 5 times 4, and I'm canceling the 3, the 2, and the 1. But I still have to divide by 2 factorial, or 2. And this gives me 10 ways of arranging 3 red balls and 2 yellow balls uh, in some ordering. In fact, 10 is so small, let's see if we can actually write them down. Um, if we just go to the green screen, uh, let's, try, let's try determining what are the 10 ways I could arrange uh, three red and two yellow balls. So we have uh, red, 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 yellow, yellow. In fact, that's one of the arrangements of the five balls. Now if I count other arrangements, what I'll do is try moving this yellow one through the, the red. So there could be a red, a red, a yellow, red, and yellow. That's where I switch the yellow with this red. Now let's move that yellow over one more time. Red, yellow, red, red, yellow. And then let's move it one more time. Yellow, red, 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 and yellow. But you notice if I were to switch these two yellows right here, that would still be the same arrangements. That's why I divided by two factorial. And if I switch any two of the three reds right here, that would still be the same arrangement. That's why I divided by three factorial. Now you know what I've done is I've moved this y all the way through. Now let's move this, this second y all the way through. So I'm going to move, I'm going to switch that y right here and I get red, red, yellow, yellow, red. Okay, so I've moved, I've switched it with this red. Now let's try switching it with this red. Red, yellow, um, red, yellow, red. So I switched it here. Uh, now, you know, another possibility is I could switch the yellow with this red, and that would be yellow, red, red, yellow, red. So I've switched it right there. So let's move the yellow into the second position, into the, actually that'd be the fourth position. Now let's try moving the second, this second yellow into the third position. I could switch it right here, and I would get red, yellow, yellow, red, red. Or I could switch it right here, and that would be yellow, red, yellow. Yellow, red, yellow, red, and red. Now, is there any way I can get the second yellow into the second column? I think the only way to do it would be to switch it right here. And that would be yellow, yellow, red, red, and red. Now, how many orderings do I have here? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Those are the 10 orderings of 3 red and 2 yellow that we've actually listed. Now, of course, when the answer is only 10, it's not that difficult to write out all those arrangements. If the answer had been 120, we wouldn't want to approach it this way. But uh, um, uh, for a small number like this, we can work it out. OK, let's go to the next graphic, and we'll, we'll conclude this by looking at combinations. Now, in this case, a combination of members of a set of distinct objects is a subset of the objects where the ordering is no longer important. And the number of combina combinations of n objects taken r to time will abbreviate as C in r, and it's computed by the formula uh, n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. So you notice that the difference here is I have an extra factor in the denominator 
uh, R factorial as well as the difference factorial. And you notice we've seen this before. This is the same thing as the binomial coefficient in R that we uh, just discussed recently when we looked at the binomial theorem. Okay, so the difference between combinations and permuta permutations is we're no longer counting order. Uh, we're only cal calculating the number of subsets that we can choose. So let's go to a, a problem where we could apply this. In how many ways can a class of uh, 30 students select uh, a committee of three to represent them? This assumes the order of the selection makes no difference. Now, you know, just a few moments ago, we worked a problem where the class was electing officers. And so, of course, the order in which we choose the people is important because the first person we pick, we were assuming would be the president. The second person would be the vice president. This time, we just want to pick committees of three. And in how many ways can we choose committees? So what we'll do is compute the number of combinations on 30 objects chosen, chosen three at a time. So these are the 30 students in the class who are choosing a committee of three people. And according to the formula, this is 30 factorial over 3 factorial times the difference factorial. That'll be 27 factorial. Okay, well, uh, if I cancel off the, 30, the, tw the 27 factorial, I'll have 30 times 29 times 28, and I'll divide it by 3 factorial, or 3 times 2 times 1. Now, you know, I can cancel the 3 with the 30 to give me a 10. That'll be a 10. I'll put the 10 right over here. And I can cancel the 2 with the 28 and get a 14. So this ends up being 10 times 29 times 14. Now, let's compute this on a calculator, and then we'll look for a button that will allow us to compute combinations uh, more quickly. OK, so uh, we want to multiply 10 times. Uh, 29 times 14, and we get 4,060. So you remember when we were electing officers, I still have that up here on the screen, we had uh, uh, almost two-thirds of a million, 650, 657 ways we could elect four officers. Now we're selecting how many, uh, how many committees of three people could be chosen. And look how much smaller it is. Of course, we're only choosing three people, but it's just over 4,000 or 4,060. OK, now here's an alternative to solving that problem. Um, suppose on the same screen here, I'll show this. I'm going to enter 30. And then I'm going to go to my math menu. Let's see if you can sc scroll, screen out, or pull out just a little bit. I'm going to go to the math button. And I'm going to scroll over to under PRB, probability. And you see on the third line, I have the number of com combinations on n objects taken r at a time. OK, so I'm going to enter that. And we're looking at, whoops, I must have pushed the wrong button. Let me do that one again. Um, I'm going to enter 30 push the math button, and I'm going to enter number 3. And, um, oh, OK. So we have uh, 30 objects, and we're choosing these three at a time, because we're choosing committees of three. Now, if I enter that, I get 4,060. Yeah, just like we computed before. OK, now, one of the things you may be wondering about is where the extra factor comes from in the denominator in our combinations formula. Uh, well, you know, if you look at the number of permutations on n objects taken r at a time, the formula was n factorial over n minus r factorial. This is where we were choosing r objects uh, out of a total of n objects and counting all of those arrangements. But you see, within those r objects, we have, we have those r objects arranged in different orderings. And if I'm choosing committees, I only want to, uh, only want to count those once rather than uh, all of the various rearrangement of those R objects. So when I go to calculate the number of combinations on N objects taken R at a time, I'm going to take the number of permutations and divide it by the number of ways those R objects can be arranged. And the number of ways the R objects can be arranged is R factorial, or another way to write this is P of R R. So this ends up being N factorial divided by N minus R factorial divided by r factorial. And that's the same thing, if I invert and multiply, as n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. And the purpose of this factor is to eliminate all the duplications 
uh, of the various rearrangements of those R objects since the ordering makes no difference in combinations. Okay, as our last example, uh, let's look at how many ways that a five card poker hand can be dealt uh, when using an ordinary deck of 52 cards. So, uh, you know, in, uh, in the game of poker, you're dealt five cards, and we're wondering in how many ways you could get five cards out of a deck of 52 cards. Now, this is clearly a problem of combinations rather than permutations, because we're not looking at the order you receive the cards, just the cards that you receive uh, once they've been dealt out. And this would be the number of combinations on 52 objects taken five at a time. Now, if I were to use the formula, that would be 52 factorial divided by 5 factorial times the difference factorial. Now, the difference here is 47, so that'll be 47 factorial. And uh, if I were to cancel off 47 factorial, what would be left in the numerator? 52 times 51 times 50 times... Right. Times 50 times... Uh, I'm 49. Sorry, times 49. Times 40... Eight. times 48, and that would be divided by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Now, of course, we could actually multiply that out in our calculator, but instead, let's go to our menu and choose combinations uh, from our math key. So, um, let's see. I'm going to enter 52, and then under the math key, I'll scroll over to probability, and I'll select number 3 and enter that. Whoops, let's see, why is there an error? Okay, and uh, that's going to be chosen five at a time. And when I enter that, I get um, 2,598,960. In other words, this is about 2.6 million, uh, roughly 2.6 million. So let's just put that down here as our answer. Approximately 2.6 million ways that you can receive a, your hand in <coughs> poker. Well, thank you very much. We'll see you next time for episode 38.